Tonight, heat apocalypse, fires, drought, and soaring temperatures grip the U.S. and Europe. New video shows homes engulfed in flames as dry and hot conditions help fuel a raging wildfire near Dallas. 88 million Americans now under alerts from California to Massachusetts, with record temperatures expected in several cities. Europe is also sizzling. Neighborhoods in London up in flames as the UK records its hottest day ever. And wildfires continue to burn in several countries. So how long will this dangerous heat last? Also, explosion at the Hoover Dam. Tourists capturing the moment a transformer burst into flames and sent thick black smoke into the air. How crews at the site rushed to put it out. Text deleted. A source tells NBC News the Secret Service has no news text messages to hand over to the January 6th committee because they cannot be recovered from the days around the Capitol riot. The National Archives now calling for an investigation. Murder charges dropped. A bodega worker cleared after stabbing a man to death during a confrontation inside the store. His lawyers argued self-defense. Could he face other charges? Daring Rescue, the new body camera footage showing firefighters racing into a burning home to save a 19-year-old and three dogs trapped inside. And the emu going viral on social media. His hilarious videos taking the internet by storm, plus the one he recorded just for us. Top Story starts right now. Good evening. I'm Savannah Sellers in for Tom Yamas, and we begin tonight with that historic heat wave baking the U.S. and Europe. Nearly 90 million Americans are under heat alerts with temperatures in several states soaring past 100 degrees and dozens of heat records likely broken. We're also watching wildfires like this one outside of Texas, Dallas, spreading rapidly as it's fueled by drought conditions. Several homes destroyed and dozens more evacuated. So far, no word on any injuries. Homes also engulfed in flames in London as record heat sweeps across Europe. The UK seeing temperatures above 104 degrees. Forget this, the first time in history. In Spain, train passengers watched in horror as a wildfire burned near the tracks. These fires burning across the continent have forced more than 1,000 families to flee their homes. We'll have more on that in a moment, but we begin tonight with Sam Brock in Texas. Canvassing the country tonight, an unbearable heat wave. Records primed to be smashed. I feel like I'm on this side. Nearly 200 million people experiencing highs today above 90 degrees, 40 million above triple digits. Some parts of the U.S. reaching supremely sweltering levels. Parts of California, the Central Plains, and Texas, with highs ranging from 105 to 113. Those particularly vulnerable to heat-related illness children and the elderly. The heat is undefeated against those who are unprepared and don't take it seriously. In some communities, emergency responders inundated with calls and overwhelmed. He's now kind of really suffering from my maybe heat exhaustion. He's having, a, he's really struggling. Throughout the Dallas area. Are you AC working properly? Police officers checking in on older residents as the county works overtime to provide AC units to low-income families, installing some 150 units in just the last two weeks. Do you think those little efforts could add up to lives actually being saved? Absolutely. They may not be used to this heat. They may have just moved to Texas. Having 108 degree weather, 110 degree weather, it's different. Residents have recently been asked to conserve energy, knowing the state's energy grid has faltered before. And with all that dry heat tearing into open spaces and threatening homes, multiple fires across Texas forcing hundreds to flee. Yet in some parts, the heat is springing water by buckling infrastructure, causing water main breaks. Please make sure that everyone in your group has a water bottle. Whether taking a summer break at camp or trying to cool off at the beach out east, where scorching conditions head next. It's way too hot to even be on the sand. The heat is on with no signs of a surrender anytime soon. And Sam Brock joins us now from Dallas. Sam, these temperatures are unrelenting. Is there any concern about the power grid there in Texas being able to keep up with demand? Yeah, there's definitely concerns, Savannah. Let me say, so far, so so far, so good today. It's been 109 degrees as a maximum here in Dallas. The system has functioned normally. The bigger problem is that the infrastructure here, I'm told, whether you're talking about gas or coal plants, is 40 or 50 years old and has not been properly maintained in some cases because there's no financial incentive to do so. The reality, then, is you're working with a small margin of energy 
Let me give you an example. On May the 13th, only six generators out of thousands in the state went down. And that was enough to trigger an alert level, low amount of available energy to send out to people to ask them to conserve. Those are the margins they're playing with right now, hoping that things hold up. Savannah, back to you. All right, Sam Brock, thank you. And in Europe tonight, a critical heat emergency. The U.K. is suffering through its hottest day on record and dealing with a major fire outbreak. Here's Megan Fitzgerald on a summer like Europe has never seen before. Tonight, the U.K. getting blasted with unrelenting heat, known for its rain, instead hitting record-setting temperatures. Today, logging highest temperatures ever, 104 degrees. The usual high in July, 75. And adding to the misery, fires now spreading across the city. Hundreds of firefighters battling flames and stretched thin as the mayor calls the situation critical. The blistering heat gripping a country not equipped for this type of weather. Train tracks and runways buckling, disrupting and canceling services. Millions sweating it out in a nation where most live without air conditioning. But climate experts say this is just the start. It's certainly um, something what the UK has never seen before. Uh, but unfortunately, I think what well, going forward, we may well see this, this type of heat across the UK more and more common. In Spain and Portugal, more than a thousand deaths and more than two dozen fires are raging, with temperatures topping a scorching 114 degrees. One Spanish fire got so close, it forced a train to stop. And in France, many Tour de France riders wearing an ice pack under their clothes. Plus, more than 30,000 acres are burning, including near Bordeaux wine country. Fire authorities believe it was deliberately set. Thousands forced to evacuate. And in Paris, temperatures as high as a sweltering 106 degrees. American tourists desperate for relief not finding it. Europeans aren't out of the woods yet. This heat wave is heading to Belgium and Germany, where record-setting temperatures of 104 degrees are expected in the coming days. Savannah? All right, Megan Fitzgerald, thank you so much. And for more on how long this will, heat will last and for what we just heard from Megan there, let's bring in meteorologist Bill Cairns. Hey, Bill. I have so many stats, I don't even know where to start oh, because just it's been so eye-opening. You know, stuff going on in Oklahoma and Texas is incredible by itself, let alone what happened in Europe. So to give you a perspective, so, you know, going back over the reliable records in England go back about to the early 1900s. So this was the warmest by far for the whole entire country. And give you an idea, 30 separate locations would have broken the old record of 101 degrees. So 30 separate spots. It's not like it was just like Death Valley, one little area. So we were 104.5. That was the hottest location. It's a preliminary report. They have to check the gauge to make sure it's accurate. But that will go down as the all-time highest temperature in the UK. And at night, it's finally beginning to cool off. I'm sure everyone has their windows open. Only 5% of people in the UK have air conditioners. So finally, as the temperatures drop, they can open their windows and get all that heat out. And then it will be a little less dangerous. Remember, that the heat wave's moving tomorrow. It's going to be more towards Berlin, 101 tomorrow. We get a break in London. Paris gets a break, too. France gets a much-needed break. But Portugal and Spain, it's still easily going to be very hot. A lot of fires burning in those areas and still dangerous. Now let's bring it back home. At one point today, it was 102 degrees everywhere you stepped in the entire state of Oklahoma. Didn't matter where you were. It's 102 or above. At 110 degrees in Oklahoma City today tied the all-time hottest temperature in July uh, record, and Dallas had a tied their high temperature record of 109. So it's still 106 and 105 in these areas. We have upped our number from 88 million now to 100 million people under heat advisories or warnings, and the record-breaking July continues tomorrow, 108 in Dallas, and then Savannah, watch out. All of this heat is starting to build to the east. It is going to be a hot period for the mid-Atlantic, D.C. has a chance of hitting on 100 this weekend for the first time in five years. So many triple digits on one map. All right, yeah, Bill endless Cairns. numbers. Yeah, really. Bill Cairns, good to see you. Thank you so much. Next to a frightening scene at the Hoover Dam, new video shows the moment a transformer burst into flames and sent thick black smoke into the air. The flames were quickly distinguished by the dam's fire brigade. The popular tourist attraction and one of the nation's largest hydroelectric facilities is located about 25 miles southeast of Las Vegas. No one was hurt, and officials say there is no risk to power in the area. No word yet on a cause. 
And now to the contempt trial of former top Trump advisor Steve Bannon. Prosecutors arguing today that Bannon, quote, decided he was above the law when he didn't comply with a subpoena from the January 6th committee. As Bannon remains defiant, NBC News senior White House correspondent Kelly O'Donnell has the details. The Trump advisor and conservative agitator now on trial. The show trial they're running is a disgrace. Steve Bannon, who had predicted this about January 6th. All hell is going to break loose tomorrow. His fate on two charges of misdemeanor contempt of Congress for failing to comply with the January 6th investigation will be decided by a D.C. jury sworn in today. Twelve jurors, two alternates, nine men and five women, diverse in race and age. Late today in opening statements, a federal prosecutor said Bannon decided he was above the law. The congressional subpoena wasn't an invitation. It was mandatory. But Bannon's lawyer declared he's innocent of the charges and asked jurors, is this evidence affected by politics? If convicted, Bannon could face at least 30 days in jail. The committee Bannon defied will focus on key hours of January 6th in a Thursday night hearing with live testimony from two former Trump officials who cited President Trump's tweet attacking Mike Pence as a last straw for them. Press aide Sarah Matthews. The situation was already bad. And so it felt like he was pouring gasoline on the fire by tweeting that. And Matt Pottinger, who was deputy national security advisor. I read that tweet. Uh, and uh, made a decision at that moment to resign. Kelly O'Donnell joins us now. Kelly, you also have some new reporting on the Secret Service and those deleted texts from January 6th. Well, Savannah, what we have learned from Secret Service officials is that the requested information was not able to be turned over in some instances because all of the phones belonging to the Secret Service agency were wiped and reset to factory settings in a long-planned IT upgrade. Now, this was not deleted on individual phones, but it was done remotely by their IT department. So some messages lost cannot be recovered. Now, there is the opportunity for agents if they believe some text messages pertain to official government records, things different than just everyday conversations. Those could have been uploaded and saved as government records, and those would be in the documents turned over. But if they had not been saved in that way, they were wiped out and can't be recovered. When I talked to Secret Service officials, they also said that most of the agents don't use texting the way most of us do. They have other encrypted kinds of communication because of the secure nature of their work. So they typically typically don't use texts in the way, the ubiquitous way, the rest of us do. Savannah? All right, Kelly O'Donnell, thank you. So with this reporting that the Secret Service has no new text to give to the committee, what impact will that have on the January 6th investigation? Well, Hugo Lowell joins us now. He's a congressional reporter for The Guardian. Hugo, thanks for joining us. I mean, of course, starting with the fact that the Secret Service says that these messages that happened to be from this particular day were deleted in the first place because of this IT reset upgrade. Now on top of that, they cannot be recovered. What do you make of that? I think it's uh, just extraordinary, and I think the select committee uh, said this internally when they met with the DHS Inspector General on Friday, uh, when they were told that the Secret Service's story for why the texts were erased kept changing. At one point it was a software upgrade, and later it was because uh, there was a device uh, swap-out program going on. But I think the point of all of this is, if you look at the timeline, the uh, the sequencing of events is very curious, right? I mean, uh, January 6 happened, and then January 16, just 10 days after the Capitol attack, Back, Congress first requested those communications. It wasn't until later in January that the device swap actually took place and that these communications uh, weren't backed up. So there was that intervening period of about 11 days when they could have turned over records to Congress and did not. Hugo, also now the National Archives is getting involved. They've officially asked Secret Service to investigate the, quote, potential unauthorized deletion of messages. They've even gone as far as to say, if you can't recover those messages, describe what records were affected. Tell us why they were deleted. And also, by the way, make a plan so that it doesn't happen again. Does it seem like anything productive can come of that investigation? And also, shouldn't the Secret Service know if the National Archives is going to want messages before they delete them? 
Well, so I spoke to several members on the January 6th Select Committee today, and they were pessimistic that the National Archives investigation would yield much of anything, uh, in part because the National Archives is effectively asking the Secret Service to investigate itself. I mean, the whole request was, you know, please go back and see if you have any records, and if you don't, and if you think they were improperly deleted, then please conduct a report and send it to us within 30 calendar days. I think the Select Committee is looking much more towards the DHS uh, Inspector General's review and whether or not he can reconstruct these missing text messages. Uh, there wasn't much optimism today, at least on, on Capitol Hill, uh, about the National Archives investigation. Hugo, I know you've been following the January 6th investigation very closely. You've been in the room for the hearings. What direction does it seem the committee is heading in for Thursday's hearing? Well, I mean, the Thursday hearing is supposed to be all about the 187 minutes of the Capitol attack and how Trump did nothing to call off the violence. He did, he did nothing to call in the National Guard. He did nothing to uh, try and get the rioters to come out of the Capitol until he sent that tweet late in the afternoon uh, around 4 p.m. on January 6. And I think the Select Committee is going to try and make the case, according to our reporting, that uh, Trump was derelict in his duty. He was derelict in his duty as commander in chief uh, to, to kind of protect the country and protect Congress. Um, and he has an obligation to do so above that of a regular citizen because he is, after all, or he was the, you know, the president at the time. And I think the committee is going to try and make the case that this was potentially criminal, right? The obstruction of an official proceeding statute says either action or inaction. And they're going to speak or try and speak to the inaction part of that statute. All right. Hugo Lowell, thanks for your time tonight. Turning now to primary night in Maryland, where a contentious battle for governor is unfolding. It's another test of former President Trump's endorsement as Republican candidates fight to shape the future of the state and the party overall. Vaughn Hilliard has the latest. The investigations into the January 6th Capitol Hill attack are not stopping Donald Trump this week from trying to propel his favorite candidates into government offices around the country. Tonight, the former president turning his attention to Maryland and their state's contentious Republican primary for governor. I'm the only candidate running for governor that will give them their, their freedom back. Trump endorsing Dan Cox, a state legislator who organized buses to D.C. on January 6th. Cox, though, was never accused of crossing police lines. Today, he's facing GOP primary opponent Kelly Scholes. I got my degree while raising two boys. Trump in a statement this week calling Scholes another rhino, short for Republican in name only. This race becoming a proxy war between Trump and current Maryland Governor Larry Hogan, who is backing Scholes. Hogan has remained one of the few outspoken Republican voices to consistently oppose Trump over the years. He's even said he is considering his own run for president, potentially against Trump in 2024. 100 percent pro-life. But working against them in this primary? An unlikely foe at this stage. The Democratic Governors Association. Up on the TV airwaves with ads promoting Cox. Dan Cox, Donald Trump's hand-picked candidate for Maryland governor. Cox seen as a likely easier candidate for Democrats to beat in the general election, frustrating Republicans like Hogan. The Democratic Party is talking about, you know, defending democracy, but they're spending tens of millions of dollars to promote, you know, conspiracy theory, believing, you know, this guy that they're promoting with that ad. Who does most of the electorate ultimately side with? Unclear. Are you voting here today? NBC's Gary Grumbach talking with voters today. I don't care about the endorsements of Trump or the governor. But I did vote for Cox for a lot of the same reason I would have voted for Trump. On the Democratic side, 10 candidates, but three at the top of the polls. Former National Party chairman and U.S. Labor Secretary Tom Perez using past comments from former President Barack Obama in one of his ads. He is wicked smart. Perez is taking on Wes Moore, the author and combat veteran backed by Oprah Winfrey. Maryland is asset rich, but we are strategy poor. And Peter Francho, the state's comptroller. Democrats hoping to take back a governor's seat in this historically blue state. On the Republican side, this race turning into another battle for the soul of the party and potentially the country as a whole. And we have Vaughn with us now in studio. Hey, Vaughn, so Democrats are actually playing this game where they're sort of investing in this further right candidate. Tell us about that and how it's going. That's right. And this is not the first state that we've seen that. We've seen them do it in Colorado, in Illinois, now here in Maryland. This is a situation that is risky. Mm. You know, Democrats on one hand are saying that these are the very candidates that are a risk to democracy. At the same time, are putting millions of dollars 
behind these very candidates. And of course, in 2016, a great number of people thought Donald Trump wasn't going to be a good general election candidate. And he won the whole thing. And now it's him whose influence we're talking about on this race. One other note is that two weeks from now is the Arizona primary. After tonight's Maryland primary, that's really going to be the next focus point. And Donald Trump is heading there on the campaign trail this Friday. Absolutely. It's an interesting point about President Trump because they're doing this, of course, thinking it'll be an easier match. But we've seen what's happened before. Exactly. All right, Bon Hilliard, great to have you in Thanks studio. Thank you so much. And turning now to Uvalde and the growing fallout over the release of new information about the police response during the shooting at Robb Elementary School that left 21 one dead. Last night, parents and students demanded answers and accountability. NBC's Gabe Gutierrez has more. I can't help but wonder if they just didn't find our children worthy of being saved. At a school board meeting that ordinarily would have discussed textbooks and budgets. You need to clean house. Instead, I'm as pissed off as everybody in this room. Came fury. Y'all do not give a damn about our children or us. The anger in Uvalde, Texas, boiling over for more than three hours after a blistering preliminary report found egregiously poor decision making during the response to the massacre. God's condolences and apologies don't mean to us anymore. Berlinda Ariola's granddaughter was killed. The only reason why you feel like you're coming out now is because you saw the videos. It's out there. And now we all know the truth. She's among those calling for the firing of school district police chief Pete Arredondo, heard pleading with the shooter. Sir, let me know if there's any kids in there or anything. This could be peaceful. The exchanges between parents don't have an answer and school board members growing more tense. I am not a coward. I am a, vi- a combat veteran of Vietnam. But perhaps most poignant, the students and themselves. Not, and I don't want to go to your guys' school if they don't have protected. The school district says it's installing new fencing, cameras, and door locks, but incoming senior Jasmine Casares, whose sister Jackie was killed, says more needs to be done. What are you gonna do to make sure I don't have to wait 77 minutes bleeding out on my classroom floor, just like my little sister did? Just heartbreaking, and Gabe joins us now on set. And Gabe, tell me, what new information are we learning about Chief Arredondo's role that day? Well, Savannah, you might remember that Chief Arredondo had said that he didn't think he was the incident Mm -hmm. commander that day, but according to this new report, he actually co-authored the district's active shooter response plan that called Mm -hmm. for him to take the lead. And moving overseas now, where Russian President Vladimir Putin began a visit to Iran to meet with both Iranian and Turkish presidents. It's only Putin's second trip abroad since launching his invasion of Ukraine, and it comes amid new U.S. intelligence that he's laying the groundwork to permanently keep the territory recently grabbed in Ukraine by annexing it. Richard Engel is with us live on set tonight. Richard, it's great to see you and so good to have you in studio here. It's great to be here. I was was saying this is the first time I've ever been with you in studio. We've been on set. Here we go. And And it's, of course, an important topic. So walk us through this. I mean, what consequences could Russia face here? What are we learning? About which one? About the meeting with Iran? The annexing. So let's start with the annexing. Most wars that we're familiar with in the last several decades have been wars, whether you agree with them or don't agree with them, Mm. of, let's say, defense. You have a security objective. The United States went to Iraq after 9-11. Let's not re-debate that war, but it was never with the idea of We're going to take this territory. We're going to make it part of the United States forever. Mm. Same thing with Israel, for example, it invades a territory. It's a large, it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, we, we think of wars in national security terms. This is different. Russia is trying to expand its territory forever. And it is laying the groundwork to do that is it is Mm. saying that the areas that it is occupied currently holding and some of the areas that it's still trying to hold are forever part of Russian territory. Now, you could say, well, who cares what Russia says? It's symbolic, that's just a legal argument. From Russia's perspective, it means a tremendous amount. And from the US Hmm. perspective, it has a a great significance as well. Because from the Russian point of view, it means when when the Ukrainians are fighting against Russians on their own territory, on still the land of Ukraine, from Russia's perspective, it will be that the Ukrainians are now fighting on Russian territory, mm. that those American weapons are fired into Russian territory, that an attack like the attacks we see every day in Ukraine when the, uh, when the Ukrainians use, our, use American weapons and fire on Russian troops, 
uh, the Russians will be, from now on will be saying those American weapons are being used as if they are attacking mm. Moscow. And I would expect uh, Russia is going to escalate its rhetoric in, in kind and perhaps escalate even more by pushing more of its weapons uh, to the border, maybe bringing out some heavy weapons, maybe even increasing its uh, threats of nuclear posture. So I, I think it is, a very, it is a very significant development. And so it could potentially even be seeing just this warfare we're seeing right now very soon, you're saying. Also, tell us about these meetings. So tell us about this trip to Iran and meeting, of course, with the Iranian president, what he's looking for there, but then also Turkey, I mean, a NATO member. What does that look like? So we could spend four hours <laughs> talking about the, the different complexities of this meeting. The fact that Putin hasn't left the country but twice, and this is the first time he's left sort of, let's call it the former Soviet space since the, the war began, means that it's important. Mm. From Iran, he wants drones. And the Ukrainians, with U.S. help, are using drones very effectively. There's a, one of the big reasons that the Russians are losing so many soldiers on the battlefield, and the Ukrainians are losing many soldiers on the battlefield, but the Russians are losing more, is because the Ukrainians have been using drones very effectively. We think of this as an artillery war, because mm. it, is, it is an artillery war. And artillery, is, they're cannons, right? You, you, you fire a cannon, and then if you don't get any reti- return fire, you advance that cannon. Mm. What the Ukrainians are doing, effectively, is they're firing their artillery, firing their cannons, but they also have lots of drones, clouds of drones, swarms of drones up above helping to guide those munitions. Because Russia is cut off from much of the international community, from technology, they need technology, they need drones Mm. in order to to level it off. That's just one thing. They want uh, want to talk to Turkey about this this possible deal Mm -hmm. to allow Ukraine to export some of its grain. Uh, Not that Russia is suddenly becoming magnanimous here, but it helps the Russian story uh, internationally. So it can say, no, no, we're not starving the world. We, we're working on a deal to allow Ukraine to export its, uh, its grain and barley and other, uh, other products to Africa and other parts of the world. So it can, it can paint itself in, in a positive light while still seizing territory, while annexing territory, mm-hmm. meaning it's trying to hold this thing forever. You said it. Of course, you're the expert on all. No, these I'm the expert on it. Just, just so we could talk it. about this for I've four hours. No, so it, I mean, it is fascinating. Thank you for walking us through that at these consequential meetings. Good to see you, Richard Engel. Great to be here. And now a look inside a Ukrainian town just six miles from the front lines of the war. Residents there managed to flee Russian occupation and alert Russian forces they meant no harm. Ellis and Barber is on the ground with their harrowing stories of survival. Before the war, more than 10,000 people called Zelenodolsk home. Locals say less than 2,000 live here now. It's a ghost town and an escape route that our team wanted to see firsthand. When you're walking in Zelenodolsk, you hear every now and again what sounds like thunder, rolling thunder, but it's not thunder at all. It is the sound of war, artillery going off not far from here. Do you feel scared hearing that living here? I think we'll survive through more horrible things. Zelenodolsk is roughly six miles from the southern front line. Mykola is from a village now occupied by Russian forces. So is Vladimir. They, like many others, came to Zelenodolsk out of necessity. At first, I was going fishing, or I should say I was trying to go, till the moment when the shelling of the riverbank started. Life here is hard but it's safer than where they were. When Russians came, they put white stripes on us, on our hands and legs. He tells us soldiers threatened to shoot anyone walking around without that white tape, and sometimes it didn't make a difference at all. There was a headquarters, an ammunition warehouse, and a school. They didn't let anyone come even 100 meters to the school. A young boy came closer. He wasn't even 30 years old. A sniper shot him dead. Russian forces now control most of the Kherson region. Villagers we spoke to claim Russian soldiers no longer allow cars to leave. My wife said, well, they will shoot you anyway, so let's get out of here. Vladimir and his wife decided to bike. They pedaled across uneven terrain until they finally reached a town controlled by Ukrainian forces, Zelenodolsk. 
I'm just happy that I stayed alive. Thousands of people reportedly fled her son the same way. Most leave their bikes and try to move far away from the front lines. There are hundreds of bikes in a shed here. Locals say all of them were ridden by Ukrainians fleeing Russian occupation. On a lot of these bikes, you'll notice people have tied white rags to them. There's two on the back of this child seat. They are a symbol people hope that Russian forces will see and know that they're not a threat and allow them to get to safety. The town keeps the abandoned bikes, hoping that one day the owners will come for them and make their way home. For now, it's the day Vladimir can only dream of. President Putin has claimed Russian forces are here to liberate people, to free them. Did you feel at any point that they were there to liberate you or to help you? Who was I supposed to be liberated from? From my house that is not there anymore? From my garden? From my neighbors? What was I liberated from? His only liberation was the one he found on two wheels. Ellison Barber, NBC News, Zelenodolsk, Ukraine. Our thanks to Ellison Barber for that. And still ahead tonight, murder charges dropped. The killing inside a New York City bodega that made national headlines why the city's top prosecutor decided to dismiss the charges. Plus, the murder of a Pennsylvania woman solved after nearly five decades. The key piece of evidence that helped police finally crack the case. And the moment firefighters raced into a home to save three dogs and a teenager. How they managed to save everyone inside. That's with us next. Welcome back. A New York City man who'd been charged with murder and sent to jail after controversial video released showing him kill a man who assaulted him behind the counter of a bodega is walking free tonight. He claimed it was self-defense. And after a public outcry today, the D.A. dropped the charges. NBC Stephen Romo has reaction from his community. Tonight, murder charges against Jose Alba, the bodega worker in this video, are now dropped. Alba claiming he was attacked by this man and killed him in self-defense. I think he should have been dismissed. I mean, he, you know, he wasn't bothering anybody. He was trying to earn an honest living. The incident received wide attention after surveillance video showing the stabbing emerged. The Manhattan DA facing backlash after charging Alba with second degree murder and setting bail at $250,000. Alba spent a week in Rikers Island jail. We put a lot of pressure on the district attorney, and you see it was a success. They have to make some type of law where you're allowed to protect yourself. In the surveillance video from the July 1st deadly encounter, you see 35-year-old Austin Simon behind the counter pushing Alba. The incident prompted by an argument between Alba and Simon's girlfriend over payment for a snack. This according to the DA's motion to dismiss charges. The document also describes Alba grabbing a knife and stabbing Simon in the heart, in his lung, and in his jugular vein, killing him. Efforts to reach Simon's family were unsuccessful, but Simon's cousin told the New York Times, quote, we are all clearly disappointed and can't understand how it's okay to take an unarmed man's life. The decision sets a dangerous precedent. Are you happy? Are you happy to be back? I think that the city needs to understand they can't do what they did to him and get away with it. And we are supporting that if he agrees to do a lawsuit, we are going to support him to do that against the city. Pressure had been building on the DA with public outcry across the city that Alba was charged with murder. And today in court, charges were dropped with plans made to collect Alba's electronic monitoring equipment from his home arrest. The DA's office concluded that a homicide case against Alba could not be proven at trial beyond a reasonable doubt. Even the mayor chiming in. In this case, we had an innocent, hardworking New Yorker that was doing his job and someone was extremely aggressive towards him. And I believe after the DA's uh, review, the DA, in my opinion, made the right decision. Alba supporters are asking for more resources to make bodegas safer for employees. And now we are in preventing mode because we feel that this could happen again, especially with the rates of crime going up in New York. NBC Stephen Romo joins us now from outside that bodega. Stephen, what have you learned about Jose Alba and what's next for him? 
Yeah, he was wounded in that incident, uh, Savannah, so we're hearing that he's still trying to recover from that. It's not clear what his plans are in the future, if he plans to come back to work. We're waiting to hear more on that. We're also hearing from the Bodega organization that you heard in that piece, saying they're concerned about his safety now that he's out and the charges have been dropped. They also say they're in discussions about a possible lawsuit for that arrest in the first place. Stephen, thank you so much. Next up, for nearly 50 years, the family of a Pennsylvania woman has waited for answers in her murder. Now, thanks to modern science and countless hours of police work, an arrest in the case. George Solis is following the story and brings us the latest. The murder of 19-year-old Lindy Sue Beekler has been shrouded in mystery for decades. Stabbed 19 times and sexually assaulted in 1975. Now... Almost 50 years later, a huge break in the case, thanks to modern science and a coffee cup. Authorities in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, arresting suspect David Sinopoli. We hope that it brings some sense of relief to the victim's loved ones and to the community who for the past 46 years have had no answers. Investigators say it was DNA that was found and preserved from the original crime scene on Beekler's clothing that led to the arrest. New technology allowing them to trace that DNA that wasn't available when the murder took place. As we look back on the DNA history of this case, we have to remember that when this crime occurred in 1975, DNA wouldn't be used in a criminal case until the late 1980s. After decades of tireless work, investigators took DNA that previously led nowhere to a lab in 2019. Then, like something out of a television crime drama, scientists were able to pinpoint the suspect's ancestry to the small town of Gasparina in southern Italy and create a composite of who they were looking for. The investigators released a, co a composite rendering of the suspect in this case. In addition to the composite, Parabon's report uh, would have included information on the suspect's skin tone, eye color, hair color, geographical ancestry, and freckling. In this small Pennsylvania community, they were able to narrow the suspect list by family history. After months of this type of research, one individual was identified who I believed was an especially compelling candidate to possibly be the suspect. Authorities say once they had a name, they began surveillance on Sinopoli for months. In February, investigators following Sinopoli grabbed a coffee cup he had thrown in the garbage at the Philadelphia International Airport and matched the DNA to the one found on Beekler's clothing. Legal experts say not uncommon in a case where the stakes are this high. So in this case, that thrown out coffee cup, fair game. Absolutely. A thrown out coffee cup is going to be fair game, especially if you throw it away in a public trash can. Generally speaking, when you throw things away, you lose your expectation of privacy. Sinopoli was arraigned and denied bail. He has yet to make a plea. Officers who worked the case for years, grateful to have made an arrest. This case has been very emotional for many of our officers. Uh, they've, they've shed tears. They've had sleepless nights, hoping one day an arrest would be made. And, and finally, yesterday it was made. And George Solis joins us now from Philadelphia. George, has the family said anything about these latest developments in the arrest? Yes, yeah, Savannah, you can imagine how difficult it's been for this family to relive this horror. Now, they were actually not present at that news conference where the arrest was announced. And we did reach out to them today, but they have asked for privacy. In the past, however, family members have spoken up about keeping hope alive and solving this case. Savannah. All right, George, thank you. When we come back, law and order ambush a crew member and father of six shot to death on the set of the popular TV show, The Manhunt Tonight for His Killer. Back now with Top Stories News Feed, and we begin with the manhunt after a Law & Order crew member was shot and killed on set in New York City. Police say the 31-year-old father was reserving spots for filming when a gunman opened his car door and shot him in the neck and head. So far, no arrests have been made, and it's unclear if the victim knew his attacker. In a statement, NBC and Universal Television say they are working with law enforcement as they investigate. Also in New York, a dramatic rescue caught on camera on Long Island. Body camera footage shows firefighters run into a burning home to save three dogs trapped inside. Crews also broke a window to pull a 19-year-old out of the basement. The teen and the dogs are all expected to be okay. 
And Toys R Us is preparing a comeback just in time for the holidays. The iconic toy company will open shops inside every Macy's store by mid-October. The return to brick and mortar comes amid a surge in toy sales since the pandemic began. Toys R Us had closed all of its physical stores after filing for bankruptcy in 2017. And now to a late breaking headline from Netflix. The company announced it lost nearly 1 million subscribers in the last quarter. That's actually a little good news as it's much lower than the 2 million it was expected to shed. So is this just a Stranger Things bump or a sign of good days ahead? NBC's Stephanie Goss reports. Tonight, streaming giant Netflix announced it was still losing subscribers, nearly a million in the last three months. Not great news, but the company had predicted it was going to lose two million. So the stock actually went up. So it seems like there's a little bit of a sigh of relief here. Last April, the company said it lost 200,000 subscribers, the first loss in a decade. The stock plummeted then, and Netflix laid off 300 employees. You hurt? I mean, my ego's a little bruised. With blockbuster movies like The Gray Man dropping this week, Netflix is trying to lure back customers. Netflix now is facing competition that it didn't see 10 years ago or even five years ago, right? I think the, the legacy media companies have done a good job building streaming services that work. Price is also a factor. A household with these four premium streaming services is paying more than $60 a month. Unsubscribing is an easy way to cut costs and battle soaring inflation. Netflix now says it will offer a cheaper service early next year, like much of its competition, one with advertising. When you start to run out of subscribers to add, um, this all of a sudden becomes a really attractive proposition. If you want to continue to expand your subscriber base, you have to go into advertising. The Netflix series Stranger Things passed a billion viewing hours this month, according to the company's numbers, which helps. But when one hit is over, subscribers will want another. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News. For more on this Netflix earning report and what it could mean for other streaming services, let's bring in Heidi Chung, a media analyst and correspondent for Variety. Heidi, thanks for being with us tonight. So just first lay it out for us. Do these numbers spell trouble or not? How are they doing? So just to kind of put it as simply as I can, this is a rare case in which bad news was great news for the company. Mm -hmm. And we're seeing investors react to this news on Wall Street with a stock up about 8% in the after hour session, which is basically investors saying, thank goodness the numbers weren't as bad as were predicted before. Um, Like we just heard in the report, a loss of 970,000 subscribers is by no means good news. And to kind of put it in context for you, Savannah, this is the second second consecutive quarter of subscriber declines. Now, that has Mm. never happened in the 25-year history of Netflix. So it's bad news, but it's good news. But does this mean trouble ahead? That is unclear. As we know, the economic backdrop right now is very challenging, not just for Netflix, but for a lot of people. We've heard that R word, that recession word, thrown out Mm -hmm. a lot as well. So a lot of eyes, a lot of folks are focusing on how consumers and their habits will change as we start to see this environment shift a little. Yeah, I know. You've been writing about, too, about how inflation is going to impact what people are subscribing to, that type of thing. Um, as Stephanie Goss pointed out, it's worth talking about Stranger Things because it's such a big hit and they also did something interesting. The latest season came out in two parts. So basically people had to stay subscribed to finish the season. Do you think that could be the future, sort of back to more of a rollout type of thing, either weekly or that two-parter rather than just binge watching to keep people on these platforms? I think we'll definitely start to see Netflix do a lot more of this releasing week by week or not releasing all of the season in one go. But it's kind of ironic, right, because Netflix started out as a company that was really disrupting traditional legacy media, and they were all about binge watching. They even coined the term Netflix and chill. (laughs) Everyone was about um, subscribing to the platform, watching a full season, watching a few movies, and then unsubscribing. But the problem that we saw was that the churn rate, which essentially just means the percentage of subscribers that unsubscribe over a certain amount of time, that was continuing to climb higher. So Netflix said, hey, you know what, we need to start thinking of a different strategy to make sure that people stay on the platform for longer. And I know there are some changes coming. So there include, it includes an ad-supported subscription, cracking down, of course, on password sharing, something a lot of people were freaked out about because I think a lot of people are using their sister, cousin, friends, old roommate, Netflix account. How big of an impact could changes like that have? And could smaller streaming services then follow suit with being stricter? 
Yeah, so Netflix is notorious for being super chill and relaxed about people sharing their passwords. I mean, your college roommate's mom's ex-boyfriend is probably still using your account, <laughs> if you know what I mean, right? So in order to cut down on that, they're really starting to test um, password sharing crackdowns over in Latin America. And that has proved to be, I guess, giving them some better news. And so Netflix, we might start to see them roll that out here. Again, you mentioned the ad-supported tier. That's going to help boost the top line for Netflix as well. And we all are paying attention to that average revenue per user number. So all of these measures are really going to help boost that for Netflix. It's just interesting, though, because CEO Reed Hastings was so against a lot of these things. But now that there's so much competition in the space and a lot of people have so many options, they're starting to have to rethink a lot of their older strategies. Yeah, you said it. Some of it is kind of ironic since they were the creators of binging. All right. Heidi, thanks for joining Top Story tonight. And coming up, tragedy in the water, a packed boat carrying a wedding party capsizing overseas. The desperate search tonight for any survivors. Back now with Top Stories Global Watch and a deadly boat tragedy in Pakistan. Officials say a boat packed with a wedding party capsized in the Indus River. At least 20 people were killed and 30 more are missing. Dozens more passengers who authorities say are mainly women and children were rescued. Officials believe the boat was too full when it overturned. Next to another deadly prison riot in Ecuador, officials say a fight between rival gangs left at least 13 inmates dead at the prison in Santo Domingo. It comes just two months after 44 inmates were killed at the same facility. More than 400 people have been killed inside Ecuador prisons since February 2021. And the race to replace UK's former Prime Minister Boris Johnson is down to three contenders. Former Treasury Chief Rishi Sunak leads the field of three candidates. Conservative lawmakers will eliminate one more candidate before the governing party's 200,000 members choose their new leader, who will automatically become Prime Minister. Johnson resigned earlier this month after a slew of scandals. And when we come back, the social media star that has people flocking to TikTok. And he's an emu. Up next, we introduce you to the duo behind these hilarious and viral videos, plus a special one they made just for us. And finally tonight, move over viral songs and dance trends. TikTok has a new star. He's got millions of views as people can't get enough of this notorious nuisance. Meet Emmanuel the Emu, a flightless bird who will crash any TikTok shoot, causing chaos. Taylor Blake joined TikTok because she thought the world might enjoy her family's farm animals. What is so normal to you is so absolutely mind-blowing to so many people. There's Ellen, Rico, Homie, Humpty. But one flightless bird kept stealing the show. Emmanuel, leave it alone. Emmanuel, don't do it! Emmanuel. Emmanuel. That's Taylor's emu, formerly known as Emmanuel Todd Lopez, and he's been pecking his way to the top of TikTok. This video alone has over 8.8 million views. Emmanuel, do not do it. Emmanuel, don't do it! Emmanuel! Don't do it. I'm trying to educate people right now, okay? What is the vibe of an emu? Like, is it surprising that he has this hilarious personality? The vibe is anxiety. Um, You just never really know. Uh -uh, uh -uh. Manual. Why? Why do you gotta be such a menace, dude? Huh? The cause of Emmanuel's anxiety? These days, it seems to mostly be iPhone cameras. Emmanuel. You know what? Do it. But it's those iPhone videos and Taylor's endless exasperation that have given this emu a worldwide audience. I was, remember when it, I was filming, I was so annoyed. I'm like, Emmanuel, seriously, now is not the time. This isn't about you right now. Well, boy, was I wrong because it's actually not about, it's not about me at all. This has never been about me. This has always been about Emmanuel. This is his world and we're all just living in it. So what's next for this famous foul? Maybe an appearance in an NBC studio? We asked for an exclusive. Emmanuel, this is huge, dude. We've got to talk. Listen. Hey, listen to me. NBC just called. NBC News? No, I'm not kidding. They want to give you your very own show. And they want to know when you can fly to New York. I didn't even think about that. He, he can't fly. He's a flightless bird. We should have thought this through. 
How cool is it to get to share your family's farm and these animals that, despite all the jokes, you obviously love and care so much about? I think that this is exactly what everybody needed, including me. I've always, you know, just wanted to create content that genuinely brought joy to people. And I feel like I'm doing that. And I genuinely like, I feel like I'm, I'm living my dream and it's just been a really, really humbling experience. Oh, buddy. Despite the fame, this is one big bird with a big heart. Can I have a hug? Can I have a little hug? Thank you, buddy. Well, that was just fun. Thanks for watching Top Story. For Tom Yamas, I'm Savannah Sellers. More news is on the way.